In the name of the living God, who is Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to do sort of like teaching for us, going through every line of the Acts reading and sort of getting into that text, and then we're going to get personal. But first of all, probably many of you know that uh, the Acts of the Apostles were written by the same author as the Gospel according to Luke um, in the canon of the, of the Scripture. Um, the Acts was placed between the four Gospels and the letters in Revelation, and it actually is a, is a really good transition going from the Gospel narratives to the continuation of it to, to, the, to the letters. But um, another way to do it is to look at the Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles as two pieces of one work. So in a way, the Acts reading, and there's one every Sunday in the season of Easter, in a way it's gospel too. So, Luke who wrote it thought it was very important to know that, that, that the history, he's a historian, that there's sort of three periods in, as faith, people of faith. And one is obviously the time before Jesus, Hebrew scriptures, the time during Jesus' life and ministry, death and resurrection. And then the third is what we're in now, the time of the Holy Spirit, the time of the church, the time of all those faithful people like us spreading the gospel. So going back to the text, those apostles, remember they were called disciples first because they were following Jesus, they were learning from the master teacher, but now they're called apostles. Those apostles were gathered on the Mount of Olives, Mount Olivet, um, it was a place that Jesus liked to go. He went there several times. He was, um, went there to pray. Uh, he went there before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He went there to send disciples into Jerusalem to prepare for that journey and for the Passover. Um, of course, the Garden of Gethsemane is there. He went there to pray rather emotionally to deal with his, with his fate with his faithfulness. He was betrayed. He was arrested. He was killed. And now he's back at Mount Olives, Mount Olivet, for the ascension. And think about those disciples who had been called by him and chose to follow him. And they learned so much. They felt loved by Jesus. His preaching and his teaching I mean, they never stopped. They had some ups and downs, but they continued to follow their master, their Lord Jesus. And then he dies. But then he's risen. He's back. And he continues his ministry, his earthly ministry, for 40 days. And now he's leaving again. I mean, that's the context of this. I mean, think about those disciples, what they went through. It's whiplash. But there they are. When the apostles had come together, and again, the apostles is a new word for them because they're being sent. They're no longer learners. They are teachers. They are apostles. When the apostles had come together, they said, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And you know when they said that, they must have, Jesus must have hung his head in, in disappointment. I mean, we've already been through that. I mean, that's, when he came into Jerusalem, that's what everybody thought. That's what the Jews thought. That's what the followers of Jesus thought, that he was going to come and save them from Roman oppression. And, and these disciples still haven't gotten it. They want to know when, when he's going to restore the kingdom back to the glory days when David was king. So he says, it's not for you to know the times and periods. It's not for you to know what God's plan. That's not important. What is important is that you stay faithful. But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when it has come upon you. So, so what's important is, is to wait to receive that Holy Spirit, this new dimension of the faith that he's talking about. What's going to happen in the future? Who knows? God knows. 
But for us to know, it's, it's not that important. When he said this and they were watching, oh, I've, I've skipped a very important line there. You will be witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea, of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I mean, think about that. They, these are just farm boys or fishermen, you know. And now the risen Christ is saying, you're going to go all over. And they did. They went west and east, north and south. And um, here we are now. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. We see clouds in Old Testament and New Testament. Um, it's a powerful image. It's a powerful image of sort of something up there. And regrettably, that's often where we think God is. But it's also a mystery. It's a mystery. You can't, you can't see clearly through a cloud. There's, there's something there, but you're not quite sure what it is. Well, it was holy. It was holy. It was a sign of sacredness. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. Now what does that remind you of? It reminds you of Easter morning when uh, there were two angelic figures there. And um, those two figures said, uh, what are you looking for? Jesus isn't here. He is risen. Well, in this case, uh, those two said, those two angelic figures said, they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him going into heaven. In other words, what are you looking for again? Don't, don't worry. Jesus Christ is going to come back in the same way and Jesus will be with you always. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. A Sabbath day's journey is about... Um, about 3,000 yards. In other words, it was, a, it was a Jewish law that on the Sabbath you could only go away from your place, your home, um, that amount of distance. In other words, it, it, you, in one day you couldn't do more than that. And so, so they were there. Uh, uh, Gethsemane and Olivet were, were like suburbs of Jerusalem, uh, those areas. So it was close by. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. We've heard about that room before, the upper room. Um, that's where those disciples went when they were scared, they were afraid, they locked the door. Jesus, the risen Christ, appeared to them. Um, that's where Thomas was saying, show me that you really are alive. Um, that's an important place. And so that's where they have returned, to that room upstairs. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas son of James. So who's not on that list? It's a trick question. Judas Iscariot is not on that list. There's a Judas there, but in other places he's called Thaddeus. But Judas Iscariot is not on that list because he has committed suicide because of the way he felt about his betrayal. But the eleven are there, and all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. So there they are in that upper room. You see, Ascension Day is 40 days after Easter. Pentecost is 50 days, so there are 10 days between Ascension Day and Pentecost Day. So they were in that room for 10 days, praying. Praying, listening to God, struggling with what's going on, but basically faithfully play, praying and waiting for God's message. Together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. In other words, no longer is it just the disciples, the eleven, but family. And as we read this today, we would add to this list, as well as his brothers and us. Because that's why we hear this story, so that we get on board, we become a part of this story. So, what about that window? What's that about? Well, this historian up here says that it's the ascension. Well, yes, it is. 
I mean, that's pretty neat that uh, every time we walk into this church, we get reminded of this story, this critical story that doesn't get as much attention as maybe it should. And, and, and maybe, maybe every time you come into this church from now on, you might look up there and remember this story of the ascension and how it touches our hearts. We've got the gospel, we've got the story of those followers. But what about us? Have you ever considered yourself an apostle? You know, that's something to think about. And what that means, do you feel empowered to spread the word of Jesus Christ? Are there questions that might pop out of our hearts or our minds like, when will this challenge end? When will I get well? When will I find a new job that I really love? When will I be really happy? You know, all of those when questions. And, and what if we get the same response that the disciples got, that the apostles got, is, um, well, I'm not going to give you that answer. But you will, we will receive power in the form of the Holy Spirit to deal with those challenges that we face in our lives. And then what if we, in fact, listen to the next part, that we will be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Okay, I don't know how many of you in this church are actually Episcopalians. Um, I mean, I hope there's some visitors, you know, who may be thinking about that. But listen, we in the Episcopal Church are just learning how to be witnesses. It's sort of a scary thing for us. But we are convinced that that's what we're called to do, and therefore we want to learn more about that. That's why we're focusing on the Bible more this, this year. That's why we're talking about listening, listening to God's Word and where that might lead us. And if we go on through this list... We can identify with standing, standing there and seeing those angelic figures and saying to us, why are you standing around looking up to heaven? Why don't you get busy? Not busy at doing something that you're not quite sure that God has called you to do, but busy at listening and searching for God's word and how it touches our hearts. And I am sure that every one of us has an upper room. You know, a safe place, a closet, a place where we really go to be still and do that waiting and listening and praying. We've got to have that sacred space. If we don't, we need to find it. So that we will be in a place to say our prayers and to listen. Um... What about that cloud thing? Uh, one of the things I really love being out here in Fort Huron County is that uh, there are a lot of mounts. We want to talk about going to the Mount of Olives. There are a lot of hills in the Piedmont section. Um, I bet that each one of us probably has a special mount or mountain or space that has some sort of elevation closer to the heavens uh, where we might go and feel closer to God. It's sort of a normal thing. And and what about the clouds out here? It talks about this cloud business, and it's always a symbol of religious activity. I think, I think the clouds out here are fantastic. I mean, coming from downtown D.C. and Arlington, I grant you the vistas are quite different. But still, I think it may be coming over the, over the Appalachian Mountains or something. They are more exciting. And, and sometimes when I look at the clouds out here, I almost feel like, I'd like to climb up into those clouds. I mean, it's a weird thought, but it is sort of, there's a mystery about it. There's a sacredness about it. There's something different. There's something calling. And I would like to think that through God's creation, we are called to listen and to find the sacred in our homes and families, in our parishes, in the world, in nature, to find the sacred so that in this challenging age in which we live, 
when faith is not taken for granted, even when God is not taken for granted, that we will find the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to empower us to be steady, to be open to God's guidance, and to share that in a way that makes a difference. So, we provide a time of silence following the lessons and the sermon, which I'm going to do right now. Why don't you look at that window and see how you might fit into this story which we've been talking about. And just be quiet and see if you can feel God's presence. Amen. Let us stand and say together the Nicene Creed.